Good morning, church. You guys want to stand up this morning? Who's excited to be here? I'm excited to be here. Let's jump into worship.
turning for good, yes he does. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn him for good. Yes, you turn him for good, yes he does, come on. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn him for good.
lift our hands up this morning church let's thank him for that faithfulness father we thank you this morning for being so faithful to us we thank you for never letting us go we thank you father that you always love us that you're always working on our behalf for good father i thank you oh lord i thank you so much for all the good things that you're doing in our lives i thank you father that you're not finished with us yet i thank you that you're still working you're still moving things you're still changing things Lord, this is our confidence. Our confidence is in you. And Father, we thank you for that. Lord, I know that we've seen you do amazing things before as we were just singing. I've seen you move mountains, and I believe you'll do it again. And so, Father, I speak to those mountains this morning, and we declare that they will be moved. We declare to those mountains you will be moved out of our way. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Amen. I believe that he's doing that for all of us today. Uh, You know, that whatever that mountain may look like in your life, I believe that it's not too big for God to move it. Amen. If we go through scripture, we see time and time again. I mean, it didn't matter how insurmountable it looked. He moved it out of the way. He took care of it. Amen. And I believe that he's doing that for you today as well. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you go ahead and be seated? We're going to continue this morning as... uh, as you're seated with communion. So I I trust that you got communion when you came in. For those of you that are here, if you did not, just lift your hand. We'll make sure you get one. Uh, For those that are joining us online, go ahead and grab your communion elements. It can be something to drink. Uh, I've seen everything from milk and pretzels. (laughs) Uh, I don't even know. I remember last year when we were doing drive-in services and uh, folks were joining 
from their car doing communion and from home doing communion. We saw all kinds of really creative ways of taking communion. So again, if you're joining us online, you can grab that. Um, I trust everybody's got that here. Again, if you're here in person this morning, two layers to that bad boy. Clear layer on top to get to that wafer. And then once you get that out, you can peel back the second layer to get to your juice. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and then we're going to pray over the, the wafer and the juice, and then we'll take it together. So that gives you a minute to get those tricky little cups open, and those that are watching online, it gives you a second to grab your elements as well. But I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. It says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. And Father, I thank you that today we get to take communion and we do it just as the scripture said that we just read. We do it to remember what you've done for us. Father, I thank you that this wafer this morning represents the body of Jesus that was beaten for us that day. Beaten so that we could be whole. Not just physical whole, wholeness, but wholeness in, an, in our entirety, in our mind, wholeness in our being, wholeness in every area of our life. And so, Father, I thank you today that as we eat this wafer, we remember the, the healing that Jesus provided for us. And I thank you, Father, that as we're eating it today, that if there's any sickness, anything trying to attach itself to our bodies, Lord, anything trying to attack our bodies, trying to produce anything other than the life of God in us, it's met with the blood of Jesus today. Father, and I thank you that it's cut off from its life source. And I thank you, Lord, that this juice, as we drink it, that's exactly what we, it represents today is the blood of Jesus. And I thank you that as we drink it, that we're reminded of what Jesus did for us again. And Lord, I thank you that it was the blood that wiped away our past. It was the blood that cleansed us. It was the blood that allowed us to be in right standing with you as if we've never done anything wrong. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you today again that as we drink the juice, we're reminded that we are forgiven and that we are in right standing with you. So Lord, we thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and eat. God is good. Amen? Amen. We're going to continue this morning with our giving. Um, you know, and at, towards the beginning of the school year, as we're getting ready for our giving, as you can see on the monitors, there's four ways that you can do that. So if you're uh, giving electronically, you can text it in, 84321. You can also go online to our website, rockfamilychurch.net. Click on the give link there do that option. Um, I know several of you do it by mail, have it coming right out of your bank account, totally an option as well. And uh, if you're giving in person, you can drop that off at Rock Central on your way out this morning when we dismiss. Um, but the beginning, towards the beginning of the school year, we had reached out to all of the buildings in the Merrimack Valley School District just to see, you know, maybe some supplies that once the school year got started, so the, the school year was, uh, the, the school district was blessed with a, a, a nice sum of money to be able to provide the supplies for every student in the school district this year. Um, so parents didn't have to do that. And, um, you know, we got about a month into the school year and we reached out to the buildings just to say, hey, you know, are there supplies maybe that you're in need of still or that you're finding maybe you're going through a little quicker than you anticipated? And so they were going through some stuff like crazy that they didn't anticipate at the beginning. And so um, 
for those of you that remember, we rallied together and went and purchased supplies for every one of the buildings in the Merrimack Valley School District. And uh, so, you know, this, it, we had several of them reaching out and, uh, you know, the buildings, that were, you know, they sent letters, they sent cards, um, you know, just reaching out to us saying, hey, thanks, appreciate it. Um, and so this last week I was reading through some letters, you know, that we had received. Um, and these were letters from the students, just as a reminder that, hey, we appreciate what you all did. You know, and this is just from one particular school building, you know, just a stack of letters that th the students got to write saying, thank you, Rock Family Church, for what you did. And I'm sharing this, obviously, with you right now because I want you to know that your giving has impacted an entire school district. See, when we give each week, there's so much more to it than just, I'm giving money to a church. See, when I release what God's put in my heart to release, I'm really releasing it to him to take it and do what he wants to do with it. So our commitment here is that greater than 20%, we want at least 20% of every dollar that comes in to go right back out to helping community, to helping missionaries, to helping ministries. And so just one of the things that you all have made happen during the school year is providing school supplies for every building in the Merrimack Valley School District. So just know that when you're giving, you're impacting lives, okay, in our community and all around the world. Amen? Amen. You know, our, our, our giving is really an opportunity for us um, to honor God. It's an opportunity to, for us to you know, it's a very tangible way to say, God, I appreciate what you're doing in my life. I appreciate the fact that you've put this in my hands to begin with, and I want to honor you with that. Um, you know, and when he allows us to step in and impact others with the finances that he brings in, it's a dance club. Um, <laughs> then, you know, all the better. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're grateful for those opportunities to be able to do that. Um, you know, we've, we've sown in many, many, many ways in our community and around the world. I know, um, you know, we, we shared that in, in Vision Sunday this year. You know, we had over $42,000 last year that we were able to sow out of this church. And so that's because of your giving. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for continuing to help us do what God's called us to do um, and just be, you know, able to impact people all over the world and here in our community as well. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, again just for the opportunity that we have to be able to be a part of a local church body. We thank you that we have the opportunity to sow of our finances into that and into the mission and the vision that you've given us. And Father, I thank you that when we've given, we've impacted lives here in our local community. I thank you for all of the lives of the students that were impacted through our giving when we were able to purchase all of those school supplies. Lord, I thank you for the families that were relieved of, uh, of having to um, feel that need of having to help resupply the schools. Lord, I thank you that you just enabled us to be able to do it. You blessed us with the abundance to be able to do it. And Lord, I thank you that every week when we give, money is going out all around our community all around our state, around our country, and all around the world. Father, I thank you. We have the opportunity to be a part of that. We have the opportunity to be a part of something that's so much greater than us. And Lord, we consider that a privilege. So Father, I thank you for this opportunity to give, to invest, and be a part of what you're doing. Father, we, we thank you again, that you're the one that provides for us to be able to do it. And I thank you that as we give, you are faithful to us to see to it that all of our needs are met as well. Lord, I don't have to worry about that because I know that when I release what you put in my heart, you see to it that I'm taken care of. And Lord, I thank you that if there's a financial mountain that needs to be moved, I thank you that it will be moved and it's moved through my giving. And Lord, I thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. A couple of things. Our mission trip last summer, we were supposed to go to Guatemala. Got postponed. Uh, supposed to be happening this summer. Um, and so our missionaries from Guatemala reached out. And they, at this point in time, are not 100%, obviously, on if it's going to happen or not. But um, if you are interested in potentially going to on that mission trip, again, it's going to be a little 
little touchy, you know, like wait and go type thing. Um, but if you're at all interested in getting, you know, just some further information or anything about that, hang out here right after service. Um, we're going to talk about that. It'll be super brief. Um, but if you're at all interested, hang out here so we can talk to you about that. I just need to know numbers wise who all is interested in that. And then number two, everybody say more sunlight. More sunlight. Next Sunday is daylight saving time. Don't forget to change your clocks, all right? Um, obviously, that's, that's next week. So I love the sunlight. Um, call me Olaf. Um, but um, yeah, so next Sunday, don't, or next Saturday, before you go to bed, preferably, don't forget to change your clocks and uh, make sure that you are here at the appropriate time for service next week. So that is next Sunday. And then one last thing I will go ahead and mention. We are one month, everybody say one month. One month away from Easter kind of crazy. So next Sunday, yay is right. Next Sunday, you will notice there will be a bin in the lobby. Um, so we're going to be collecting individual bags of individually wrapped candy for our Easter egg hunt. Um, we do that out on the parking lot every year. Thousands of eggs out there, ton of fun. So if you want to bring in some candy for that, you can drop that in the bin in the lobby. That's what that's there for. So just know it's there to be dropping candy in and not taking candy out, right? <laughs> You'll get all the candy that you could ever want, probably on Easter. We'll make sure of it. All right, so that'll be out there next week, just so that you're aware. And if you would like to participate, you can. Let's go ahead and get started. We are going to, obviously we took communion this morning, and so we're going to start a series today, and it's simply called this, Remember. And we take communion here at Rock Family Church. We do it the first Sunday of every month. And as we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we do that to remember what Christ has done for us. He gave the, the directions. You know, you're going to do this, you do this to remember me. And so what I want to look at today is we're looking at this series on remember. Today's title is simply this, crucifixion. Remember crucifixion. So as we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just as a recap from when we were getting ready to take communion, he said this. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he went on to say, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. So he was telling them this, and this was all prior to the crucifixion, right? So I want to look at, we're going to walk through, we're going to go into the book of Matthew. So if you've got a Bible and you want to turn with me, you can turn with me there. If you're on a device, you can go there. But I'm going to start in Matthew 26, and I kind of just want to walk through, if you will, this morning, remembering the crucifixion, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. You know, the, the broken body and the blood poured out that we take the communion elements to, to, to remember, all of that had some, some, some background to it. And so I want to look at that today. And so we're going to go to Matthew 26, and we're going to start in verse 36. And so, so kind of some steps here, if you will, as we're remembering the crucifixion, the, this first step is simply called prayer. This is when Jesus prayed in the garden. So Matthew 26, verse 36. Are you with me? Everybody good? This is yes? Talk to me. Come on now. Talk. All right. Y'all are quiet this morning. Here we go. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. <laughs> he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak." Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. 
But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. A couple of things that I want to unpack again as we're looking at, you know, again, just the series of remember and remembering the crucifixion. So here's Jesus, you know, and he's got some of the disciples with him. And, you know, he, he says, I, you know, I want you all to stay here and pray. And I'm going to go over here and pray. And what happened when they began to pray? They fell asleep. How many of us have ever had that happen before, right? Oh, I'll pray before I go to bed, you know. Oh, I'll, I'll pray when I lay down in bed, you know, right? You know, I'm, I got, I'm, I'm all cleaned up. I'm in my jammies or whatever you're going to sleep in. And, uh, you know, I crawl into bed. God, uh, right? And we're asleep. Like in no time, sound asleep. And Jesus comes back and he's like, fellas. <laughs> Notice what he said, couldn't? You watch with me even, how long did he pray for? If I'm just reading that, like just words here, he says, couldn't you keep watch with me for? I mean, five minutes is tough sometimes, right? And he's like, couldn't you even pray with me for an hour without falling asleep? And then he goes back and he prays a second time. And what happens? They fell asleep again. And he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh or the body is weak. What I find so interesting is how well we can relate to the disciples in so many things, right? Our intentions are good, but we're not always following that up, right? Jesus is going and praying for potentially an hour here about this. And what I really love about him when he's praying, you notice what, he, what, what his words were as he's praying? My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want your will to be done. So basically, what is he saying? I know what I'm about to have to endure. I've seen this before. I know. I understand. And it's not going to be good. It's going to be excruciating. And I know that. And so if you can take this away from me, if we can get the job done some other way, please let's go that route. But if not, I'll do it, right? That's what he prays. He returns, they're asleep. He returns a second time to pray and he says, Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, right? I mean, it's like, can we do this some other way? And then, you know, look, you know, I understand that if the only way to make this happen is that I have to be the one to do this, then I'll do it. He's praying and committing to the will of the Father, right? I recognize that you and I are sitting here today because of the commitment he made when he prayed. Knowing what he was about to endure, he committed to it anyway right? Most of us, we're like, I'm a Christian. I want life to be easy, right? Don't make this hard. Don't make it challenging. Don't make me do anything I don't feel like doing, right? Don't make me serve in the children's department, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like when you get on an airplane, right? What's everybody's, everybody's hope when you get on an airplane is what? It's going to be a smooth flight, right? I don't want any turbulence whatsoever. I don't want to feel a bump, and we take that into our lives as well. I want my life to be so easy. I want it to be smooth. I don't want a bump. I don't want, any, I don't want anything whatsoever. I don't want any monkey wrenches thrown in there. I don't want, you know, I want it all to go my way. I want it. And Jesus said, Father, no matter how painful it has to be, no matter how torturous it has to be, I'll do it. And because he did it, you and I are here today. So the thing is, we, as we read that, we have to up our commitment that Father, no matter how trying it might get, no matter how tough it might be, what you're calling me to do, I'm in. Right? 
I commit. Because here's the thing. If we look around right now and we see just the number of people that are here today, when you and I commit to today, no matter what the challenge is, no matter how hard it might be to doing what the Father's asking of us, there will be other people here next time because you made the commitment. Amen. You're here because Jesus made the commitment. Who can be here next time because you made the same commitment to the Father? This road to the crucifixion, there was a lot happening, and Jesus committed to stay the course. The second phase of this that I want to look at as far as remembering the crucifixion, the first was just this prayer, you know, him, him committing. The second was his arrest. So we're going to continue there in Matthew 26, picking up where we left off. Now we're in verse 47. It says, and even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Ju Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, notice his response, my friend, My friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? Then Jesus said to the crowd, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with clubs and swords to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. All right, so first phase, prayer, he's committing. Second phase, he's being arrested. Now notice this, again, Jesus had been, right, with Judas all this time. He'd been discipling him, right? They were close. And here is the one who becomes the traitor that would turn him over to those who wanted to kill him. Jesus knew this. He knew what was about to happen. And yet when he comes in, what does he call him? Friend. My friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Now, most of us would be in the position of the one of the men with Jesus who pulled out his sword and struck at the high priest slave, right? We would be the one going like, oh, no, -uh, right? We would be the one pulling out the weapon and being like, I'm cutting off your ear. Like, I mean, that would be our response, right? We wouldn't be going, friend, go ahead and do what you wanted to do. I've committed myself to the will of the Father. Go ahead and do what you want to do. We'd be the one going, uh-uh, not happening, like sword in hand ready, right? And you notice what happened is when he did that and he slashed off the, sla the priest's slave's ear, what did Jesus say? Put away your sword. Notice he didn't say, you had every right to do that. Good job. He said, put away your sword. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us? Now this word, thousands, originally when you go back to the Greek is actually legions, right? And it's actually 12 legions. So this thousands, it just says thousands, but it's 12 legions. How many are in a legion? Okay, so a legion is actually a, more of a military term, and it means anywhere from three to 6,000 soldiers in a legion. And he said, don't you realize that I could ask my father for 12 legions? Three to 6,000 per legion. Three 
360,000 up to millions of angels that I could ask my father for. And he would send them, as he said, instantly. Jesus said, you know what? I have the right to ask my father for angels to come and protect me right now. And he would send them like that. But I have committed to him. And so therefore, I'm not going to. Because why? Because something has to be carried out here and I'm the one to carry that out. See, our response is when somebody comes at us, we want to do what? We want to respond. We want to push back. We want to fight, right? And Jesus said, hmm, no, I'm not doing that. Because I'm committed to my father. And I know that if I needed his protection, he would send it. But I don't need it right now because I'm about to do what he called me to do. After this, Jesus is put on trial. Again, just kind of walking this process out. He's put on trial. Of course, he's wrongfully accused, right? All the people are screaming, crucify him. They wanted another prisoner, Barabbas, released. And we get to the place where the torture begins. In Matthew 27, Again, as we're just continuing right along here. Matthew 27 and verse 26, it says this. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Now, a flogging with a lead-tipped whip. So the, the whip had balls of lead on the end of it. And... For the, uh, for the, the individuals that had the more heinous crimes, if you will, they, they upped the ante with this, okay? Um, they used what was called a cat of nine tails, which is a whip, but instead of just having one leather strap on it, it had nine leather straps on it. Had the, the ball of lead at the end, sewn onto the end of it, But it also had shards, pieces of cut glass and metal woven all throughout it. So you have nine pieces of leather with shards of glass and metal and a a ball of lead at the bottom. Now the ball of lead served multiple purposes. So when they would go to whip, that ball of lead carried the weight so that that strap would do its purpose, right? So not only would it carry the weight to make sure that that leather strap was hitting the victim, But it also, because that weight, would wrap around, and so you're getting hit, you know, pummeled with that lead as well. So, again, for the the more severe cases, when they added in all of these shards of glass and metal, that lead would do the same purpose, wrap itself around, hit, but then it also does what? Causes that also to puncture the skin. So you've got a whip with nine pieces of leather all of which have the broken glass, the metal, and the lead hitting at somebody who is completely exposed. And their way of doing it was 39 typically times. So you're getting a whipping 39 times, and every time when all of that latches on, have you ever had a cat? Claws come out, right? What's the last thing you want to do at that instant? Pull back real fast, right? Because what's it going to do? It's going to rip. So I was in South Africa, and we went to a, an animal park, and they, one of the guys that worked there, you know, we're, we drove around and stuff, and they had this area where you could go and see the animals in little pins and stuff, and the guy's like, hey, you want to go in with the baby lions? I was like, yeah, sign me up. And so he was like, all right, you know, so he, he grabbed a couple of us and he took us over to this pen and they had these lion cubs in there and they were all between like three and six months old. So they weren't like tiny, 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 but they weren't huge either. And he said, okay, here's the thing you need to remember. He said, they're very playful and they're not declawed. He said, so if they latch on 
whatever you do, do not pull away real fast. Because it, he said, I'm telling you right now, you will have open wounds. So he said, here's what you do. If they latch on and they put their claws in you, you ball up your fist and you pop them on the nose because they know that when you do that, they let go because they're just like a kitten. They want to play. So sure enough, we get in there and I've got, you know, this lion cub and it's on its back. And so I'm just rubbing its belly, you know, and it's all purring and playing around and stuff. And the, it sat up and it wrapped its two front leg, you know, like just wrapped around my leg. Well, when it did, it just flipped out all those claws right into my calf muscle and is because he sat up this way so when he did he bit a hold of the front of my foot and then his paw was on the back of my calf and all those claws went right into my calf and all I remembered was don't pull <laughs> so I balled up my fist and I popped him on the nose and he let go but I had these puncture wounds on my calf muscle you know on the back of my leg from him doing that. And I thought, I'm glad he told me that prior to, right? Because if I would have just went, whoa, it would have just. <laughs> Same thing. Because what they would do, whip, pull. When you pull, you're getting some serious damage. So they had him scourged or flogged before, having, before turning him over to be crucified. When you read, like when you go into medical studies about a crucifixion, um, many, many, many doctors say that Jesus was beaten so profusely that he was unrecognizable as a human being. because of the extent of the damage done from being flogged or scourged. This is part of the crucifixion. So we go from that to him then being mocked. Matthew 27, continuing on in verse 27, some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head, and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. So this is what a crown of thorns looks like. So after he endures the beating, they wove one of these together, stuck it on his head, and then they pushed down on it. I wouldn't even want to begin to attempt to try to put that on my head. Go back to the prayer at the very beginning. Jesus knew what he was going to encounter. And he committed to it anyway. It says here that they mocked him. They spit on him. They took a stick and hit him on the head. This is on his head, right? And then they take a stick and hit him with this on his head. And yet he committed to all of this. Then we get to the crucifixion, Matthew 27, verse 32. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And they went out to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. The soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall, but when he had tasted it, he refused to drink it. After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. It read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. 
You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't even save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. Several things again to unpack. So they come across an individual and they have him carry the cross. Here's the thing. What they would do is the, the upright part of the cross was already there. But they would make them carry the cross beam. Super, super ridiculously heavy. He was, bit, he was so physically beaten, he no longer had the strength to even pick that thing up and carry it. I mean, you can imagine, I mean, he's just struggling to try to even keep himself upright, much less carry anything, and he's just falling down. So they pull somebody else and say, hey, you're going to carry this. So they get him there. It says that they gave him wine mixed with bitter gall, but when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. Essentially what they were trying to do, it was, it was a way of... Um, not drugging him, but it was a way to try to give him something to relieve the pain. And Jesus refused to take it. Because why? Because he was fulfilling scripture. He refused to take it. So then they nail him to the cross. So when they would crucify someone and they would nail them to the cross, they would nail the spikes. Goes right here in the wrist because of the way the bones are and come together right here, you can put the, the, the spike through there on both your wrists because it would support the weight of the body up there. If you put it in the hand, a lot of times you see pictures of it in the hands, but if you put it in the hands, there's nothing there to hold that weight, right? So when you're hanging up there, it would, you would just rip right off. So they would nail right here through the wrist and then through the feet. And so the individual hanging on the cross had their hands pulled, not completely taut, a little bit of slack there, and then their feet were on top of one another, and they would drive it straight through. And the reason they did that was so that the individual on the cross would suffer even more. Because if they were, had that little bit of slack, they could relieve themselves, because you're trying to relieve yourself from all of the pain, but the problem is when you go to dip down like this and you're hanging this way, you can't breathe. So then you have to push up with your feet to try to catch your breath. But the problem is there's so much pain in your feet, then you go back down. And so the person that's hanging on the cross, you've got nerves running through, okay? So not only are you obviously in all this pain, but you've got nerves that you're feeling the excruciating pain jolting through your body. So they're pushing up and then sagging down and pushing up and sagging down and pushing up and sagging down. And you do this for hours until you die. It was the absolute worst punishment anybody could endure at that time. And they did it so that everybody walking back and forth, like if you were traveling from town to town, everybody that was traveling on the road saw the ones that were being crucified. Thus, the reason you have everybody mocking him as they're going by. So not only is he, you know, he's been wrongfully accused He's been tortured. He's now hanging on a cross and people are continuing to mock him and taunt him. And all the while, he knows why he's doing what he's doing. All the while, he knows that what he's doing is to fulfill scripture. All the while, he understands that the things that he taught them, that they're now spewing back at him, they didn't get when he taught them. And yet he never said a word in retaliation. He never tried to fight. He never tried to, you know, um, say anything in response because he knew what he was doing was fulfilling scripture. He knew that what he was doing in all of that, he knew that what he was doing and being wrongfully accused and being mocked and being tortured, he knew that what he was doing was setting up an opportunity for you and I to be right here today. Let that sink in. So again, we take communion to remember what Jesus has done for us. 
but it's so easy to just glaze over and, you know, we pray and, you know, thank you, Lord, for the wafer. Thank you for the juice. They represent the body of Jesus that was beaten. They represent the blood that was poured out. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And we go on. But when we remember the crucifixion, totally different. And I get it. It's more, it's more somber. It's more weighty. You know, it's got more of a heavier tone today. I get that. But Jesus made a commitment to his father. And he made a commitment that no matter what it took, he was going to see to it that you and I would have an opportunity at heaven. Because when I remember the crucifixion, the whole part of this story is you and I. Why did he endure all of that pain? Because he could have said, I'm out too uncomfortable, don't want to do it. I mean, he told him, I could ask my my father for 12 legions of angels right now and he would send them instantly and we'd be out of here. He had a way out. And he said, I'm not going to go that route. Why? Because I already prayed and I've already committed that if I'm the one that has to drink this cup, then I will do it. And what was that cup? That cup was providing a way for you and I to get back to the Father because mankind had been separated from the Father and Jesus came to do what? Restore that relationship because he knew that you and I, as human beings, we don't stand a chance at heaven if it's not for him. There's not a thing you and I can do to get to heaven on our own. And Jesus knew that. So he said, Father, you know what? If I'm the only one that can make this work, if I'm the only one, I'm in. You and I are here today because of what Jesus endured. You and I are here today because he was willing to be crucified for you and me. That's, that's a tough pill to swallow. Because there's times I don't want to be bothered to do easy stuff. Right? Much less allow myself to go through what he went through. But he did it. He committed to it. And he was willing to be crucified so that you and I could have a relationship with his father, so that you and I could have an eternity in heaven, so that you and I could come to know him and have his influence in our lives, so that you and I could have the Holy Spirit to guide us in life, so that you and I could have him actively working in our lives here on this earth to make life here on earth as it is in heaven. That's why he did it. And he did it willingly. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and stand up. (coughs) Thank you, sir. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for today. And I thank you that we have the opportunity to be here together. We have the opportunity to be gathering online. And Father, I thank you that we took communion today and we did it as Jesus directed the disciples so that we could remember what he had done for us. And Father, I thank you that as we are in this series of remember and we look back at the crucifixion, the words thank you don't seem adequate enough of a response for what Jesus committed to doing. But Father, we thank you for sending him. Jesus, we thank you for your commitment. And even when we here on this earth have tough times with our own commitments, when I remember what you did for me, 
really uh, begins to hit home. You said that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I realize just how weak I am. But Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to give me the, the courage, to give me the strength to stay committed to you, to stay committed to the assignment that you have for me. And Father, I thank you that you're helping all of us to rise to that occasion, to rise to that level where we say, no matter what my assignment is, no matter what it requires of me, no matter if it requires me to lay down my life, Father, I commit to you. And Father, I thank you that you help us to see that the things that you've asked of us are for the benefit of others. Jesus committed to the assignment you had for him for our benefit. And when we commit to the assignment that you have for us, others benefit. And so Lord, I thank you that as we commit to the assignment that you have for us, we'll see others brought into the kingdom. We'll see others brought even into our church. So Father, today, we take that step and say we're committed to the assignment you have for us. Father, we're not going to fight any longer. We're not going to push back any longer. We're going to commit. And we're going to fulfill that assignment that you have for us. And Lord, for some folks that are listening to my voice, that first step in that assignment is just receiving you as their personal Lord and Savior, having a relationship with you. Holy Spirit, I thank you for drawing people in. And I thank you for using us as a church to help them in that journey. And we thank you for all the things that you've done for us, all the things you continue to do for us. And we thank you for all the things that you're going to continue to do through us because we're committed to your assignment. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You have an assignment and it's specific to you. And I encourage you, seek it out. Ask God what that assignment is for you and commit to it. Because here's the thing. When you commit to the assignment that God has for you, again, there's, there's really some amazing things that will come your way personally. But the benefit that your assignment has on others will outweigh anything you ever do. Amen? Amen. All right. Don't forget, um, next Sunday... Daylight saving time, so change clocks. Also, we're going to start collecting the candy for Easter. Um, a month away, Easter's already here. Um, so uh, be ready for that. If you're, again, if you're giving today, you can drop that off at Rock Central on your way out. Um, also, want, just want to remind you, so Rock Central, kind of the information hub for us here at Rock Family Church, um, we have lots of things there for you to take advantage of, so check it out. Uh, we've got life journals there. We've got Bibles if you need one. They're there. They're free. You can have a Bible. Um, those are there. All of our uh, merchandise is there, so you can purchase hats, t-shirts, 10 bucks for all the t-shirts. Um, I know it's getting a little warm for hoodies. We've got a few of those left. We've got long sleeve hoodies as well, the lightweight, more t-shirt type hoodie. We've got those there. Um, we've got bottles of hand sanitizer, like travel size. You can drop in your purse or in the uh, console of your car. Those are for free. Rock Family stickers, those are free. So stop by, chat with the individuals that are there, take advantage of anything that's there that can help you out in your journey with God. Amen? Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you guys next time.